Welcome everyone to this presentation. My name is Joss Colchester. I'm going to walk you through a high level overview to our Systems Innovation Labs guide. You'll find the full guide on our website. So this is the contents that we'll be covering today. It's how to set up a Systems Innovation Lab. We'll then go into the process that's involved in running a lab and we'll talk a bit about facilitation towards the end. So what is a social lab or a systems innovation lab? I'll be using those two terms interchangeably here. Um, this is a definition taken from Said Hassan, who wrote the book on the subject. A social lab is a strategic approach towards addressing complex social challenges. As a strategy, it isn't too hard to grasp. It can be stated simply. Bring together a diverse, committed team and take an experimental, prototyping-based approach to addressing challenges systemically at a root cause. So that's the idea of a social lab. It's a relatively new idea, maybe a couple of decades old. What we're talking about here are systems innovation labs, uh, very similar. It's a little bit more orientated towards systems thinking. Systems innovation labs are open collaborative spaces for the co-creation of solutions to complex social and environmental challenges. It's good to draw the analogy with the traditional concept of a lab. And so just as we have science labs for our technical challenges where we experiment in safe to fail environments, systems innovation labs aim to do the same for the complex societal challenges. So we're all aware of the traditional lab, but that's obviously focused on science and more technical problems. This is a similar concept. We're taking an iterative experimental approach, but now it's dealing with complex systems, uh, which makes it quite different, as we'll see. So why do we need a lab and why now? It's related to this idea of a wicked problem, uh, the rise of these very complex problems in our economy, in society, environmental challenges and so forth. We know that these require new approaches, new ways of bringing people together to tackle those problems. The lab approach has emerged recently as a way to respond to situations that are complex in nature and kind of outside the box. So the kind of key aspects of a lab, it is an approach to doing systems change. It's not theoretical systems thinking. It's not ideas and models from systems change. It's actually a practical thing where we try to do systems change, right? We try to bring people together and iterate through a process of them trying to solve the problem for themselves. So it's an approach to doing systems change is one way of understanding it. It's also a space, so the, the idea of a lab that conjures up illusions of space, the traditional concept of a lab. It's a place so it's a place for convening diverse actors it's also about experimentation so it's a method for exploring complex issues experimentation is at the heart of that and it's about collaboration collaboration is very much central to systems change and this is a way of enabling uh, collaboration and the co-creation of solutions the lab approach is based upon systems thinking and focuses on changing the structure of systems so it's a systemic approach we're interested in how to change the structure of systems. It represents a method for applying these ideas of systems thinking, um, putting them into practice to really try and change systems. So it's holistic in its consideration of challenges and solutions. It's an open approach. I think this is a very important aspect to it. Uh, these are platforms, open platforms for co-creating solutions, open spaces for collaboration and alignment around an issue. So they bring together diverse actors. No one organization can do it. You need to create a big ecosystem of actors. And this is what it's about. It's creating the space, uh, an open space, to bring those different actors together to work around a problem rather than dividing it up so that it fits into the existing organizational structures. That's an important issue. We're dealing with something complex here, and we have to do that in a holistic way. And that means we can't divide it up and divide it out into those different organizations or take it out into those different organizations. We have to kind of bring people together around the issue where it is in the space that it is. They're not inside any organization that is removed from the problem, but typically embedded within the local context where the issue is being experienced. So it's a collaborative approach. The nature of wicked problems is, is such that no one organization can affect meaningful change. System change is about the alignment of actors within an ecosystem to realize the emergence of new patterns and behavior, kind of higher level functions. And collaboration is really core to that. So we're trying to create the structures that will enable collaboration. That's a big part. The aim of the lab is to create a collaborative platform where actors that would otherwise not agree or like each other can come together to realize collective ends. 
experimentation is a key aspect of the lab approach. We're not trying to execute on a predefined plan or have a conception of what the solution is yet. We're trying to figure out, we're trying to learn together what that might be and that requires experimentation. So wicked problems exist in the space of unknown solutions. As such, we have to take an experimental approach to develop responses. Like the labs of yesterday, social innovation labs are not driven to execute on a predefined solution, but are a process of experimentation and innovation. Labs are action oriented but they're also spaces for learning. They involve a constant interplay between action and learning, what we call action learning. They are grounded in action, in trying to change systems, but there's a recognition at the same time that we don't actually know how to do that within these different contexts because it's complex. So there's a lot of learning going on at the same time. At the same time that we're doing, we're learning, and that's kind of what labs are about, right? They're creating these safe-to-fail environments where we can um, experiment so as to learn rapidly and try and find uh, solutions. So labs are a new concept, but there's already many of them out there in the world. We have food labs. Uh, the Sustainable Food Lab is one very successful example, but many others. Uh, health labs, energy labs, living labs in cities to try and change different areas of communities within cities, experiment with new solutions there. There's educational labs and so on. So that was a very high-level overview of what a lab is. We're going to now dig into how to set up a lab and what we will need to do that to different aspects. So we're going to have to create some kind of context around why we're doing this. What is the purpose of the lab? We're going to create some kind of space, structures for collaboration, and methods for experimentation. So the context, we're going to need to create some kind of overarching narrative to frame the issue and create the initial context for coming together. To start a lab, we need a reason. What is it we're doing? Why are we doing it? This is not about providing solutions. It's about creating the context for setting up a lab. It's not about saying that we have a predefined solution, but instead it's opening questions to try and frame the issue in new, new ways to reveal new dimensions to the challenge and set that initial kind of context that attracts the members in to form part of this process of trying to figure out solutions. So it's about creating space. The lab space should be outside. As I was mentioning, it's best to have it outside of any kind of traditional organizational setting and the, try and get people out of their comfort zone and into the environment where the, the problem is really being experienced. It's hands-on, just like a lab. Uh, we do things practically in a lab. It provides space where people can explore the issue in a physical way. So it's an attractive space. It should attract people in. Uh, you know, these organizations don't have to be there. The individuals don't have to be there. You're going to have to be attracting them in if you're going to get them there. Uh, so you want to make it fun, experimental. Letting people express different dimensions to themselves is important. Also, we need to create a kind of context where people can be open and sharing, um, it's integrated. You have to be kind of where the problem is and have all the things you need at hand because, you know, this is about rapid kind of iteration and experimentation. If you want to do that, you're going to have to have the things you need to do that. You can't wait a few months for a grant or for permission for this or that. It's like being in a lab where you have all those tools around you, all those you know, different chemicals or whatever it is, and you're able to quickly mix them together, you know. So the lab space is going to have to be kind of in a setting where it has everything that it needs, has the kind of connectivity in terms of communications and resources and so on. Collaboration, we're going to have to set up some kind of structures for collaboration. The aim is to transition a group from a fractured and siloed ego-centered structure to an integrated eco-centered model trying to create ecosystems. This requires an understanding of collaboration and the formation of structures to enable the formation of shared intent amongst the group. So there's many considerations here. We go through some of those in the guide. Question of having everyone represented at the table. There's also questions around power dynamics and how you deal with those. We need a, some kind of systematic method or process for doing experimentation. It can't just be randomly exploring anything. Uh, these are safe to fail environments for exploration. The aim is to maximize learning through constant iteration. So it is a systematic process of experimentation. It's not a random one. We iterate through this process, learning about the system, adjusting our assumptions and refining our hypothesis. So it's very much like the scientific method. We need to kind of embed this at the core of what we're doing. Uh, we need to formulate some kind of hypothesis about what might work or how the system works. Then we test that hypothesis, right? We do an experiment. We uh, intervene in the system. We create some kind of safe to fail environment where we can test our little hypothesis 
that gives us some feedback. We can take a look at that and we can learn from it, right? And we can see, did our hypotheses work? Was it correct? And that learning can feed back into the creation of the next hypothesis or the adjustment. We can see, well, do we need to adjust things? Do we need to throw it out? Do we need to start a whole new hypothesis and so on? So that's a systematic approach, scientific method for doing systems innovation, for experimenting in the lab. So the next section jumps into process. A lab is a process for doing systems innovation. What we have are a series of guides that walk you through this process. And it's really the heart of what we're, what we're doing here. So, so this process is a combination of the key aspects required to do systems change. It takes a compact form so that facilitators can use it as the foundations to scaffold their lab. So the contents of the guide should be complemented and fleshed out by the facilitator with additional material. So this is really the heart of the whole systems innovation process or lab. So it's composed of four main dimensions to systems innovation, systems thinking to understand what we're doing as a system, to be able to embrace and work with complexity. We'll go into these now in a second. So systems mapping to map out and understand the structure and dynamics of the system. Systems change uh, to envision alternative futures and points for intervening in the system. So systems building, developing platforms, connecting people and resources in new ways and scaling change. As we all know, same old thinking will create the same old results. Uh, thus, we need to start by changing our ways of thinking and looking at the world in new ways. We need a new paradigm. The aim is to elevate our thinking and vision of the system from seeing not just parts, but to seeing and understanding the whole system. And that's what systems thinking is going to help us with. Uh, we need to learn to recognize and work with complexity rather than pushing against it. So we're trying to walk the members through a process of changing their paradigm or becoming aware of their ways of thinking, their reductionist ways of thinking, and changing that to a more holistic vision so they have a better opportunity to see the whole system rather than just seeing the parts. And that creates kind of a radical new space of opportunity and innovation. So it starts with critical thinking, uh, trying to become aware of our ways of thinking and motivations. Systems change as much a kind of personal change as it is about change out there in the system. We need to be aware of ourselves. We need to be reflexive of how our ways of thinking, our motives, are influencing the systems change process. We introduce the new paradigm of systems theory, go through all the different models, holistic thinking, synthetic thinking, so on and so forth. Systems modeling, we start to try and understand what we're doing, um, what we're dealing with as a system and complexity theory, again, an appreciation for how complex systems work and how we might work with complexity rather than push against it. So that's the first section, and then it comes to systems mapping. We should not change a system without first gaining a deep understanding of its overall structure and workings. And this is a key premise. You're not gonna get the results that you want. You're gonna get unintended consequences if you don't have a deep understanding of the system. And to do that, you need to map it out. The aim of systems mapping is to give us an in-depth analysis of the current state of the system. So these guides here will walk you through the different tools um, you need to start to map out your system. It's firstly the basics of systems mapping, that basic kind of language. Actor mapping for mapping out actors in the system, their values, models, and incentives. Causal loop and system dynamics uh, models, looking at the causal relationships, the underlying feedback loops, and so on. Also, the iceberg model there, and multi level maps uh, for mapping out the system on its different levels. So, that's systems mapping. We then dive into systems change, right? We've got, we've changed our way of thinking to a more holistic paradigm. We've mapped the system out to get an understanding of how it's working and so forth. And now we can start thinking about actually trying to change that system, trying to intervene. So this is a lot about understanding transition processes. Uh, systems change is really about working with transitions in complex systems. So here we talk a lot about transitions through different models and how to influence those changes, how to influence the transition and identify leverage points. And working with context is also an important part of that. So we start off by trying to understand transitions. Uh, we use this this framework of the three horizons model for change is very useful and also the two loops model which is another one for understanding transitions but it's more focused on the connection relationship between the old regime and the new emerging alternatives 
that's a two loops model for transitions we look at leverage points how to intervene in the system and narratives for change telling stories to create future visions for the realization of constructive change so that's um, systems change we're trying to understand the transition process and how we might influence it in a positive direction so the final section in this process, this series of guides here, is systems building. The job of the systems innovator is to develop collaborative ecosystems that align diverse actors in new and synergistic ways. So we're really building networked organizations. We need to understand something about that. The key aspects to consider in building collaborative networks of diverse actors and realizing systemic impacts. So networks essential to that. How do we foster and develop networked organizations through platform design? Um, how do we create new value models that work to align actors within the overall ecosystem? How do we start to work with negative externalities and reincorporate them to get something more sustainable? How do we scale change, work with network to scale further, faster and remain agile? And then think about impact. How do we assess the impact that our systems change initiative is having so that we can know where to invest our resources and what's working, what's not working, etc. So that's kind of the process at the center of the Systems Innovation Lab. We're now going to talk a bit about facilitation. How do we facilitate that process when we're running a lab? Running a lab will require someone to support and guide members through the process. You do need a facilitator. The job of the facilitator is about helping a group to identify common objectives and offering a process to achieve those while maintaining neutrality. So it's a skill and an art of leading people through processes towards agreed objectives in a manner that encourages participation, creativity and ownership by all involved. The essence of the facilitation is about enabling process. We're creating a space here, a platform for co-creation. Other people are actually going to create the solutions. The facilitator is just helping them work through that process of doing that. So a facilitator's role uh, is to create conducive context, uh, to plan the process, inspire creativity, promote transparency, adapt processes needed, create the flow of activities. So they're stringing things together and they're adapting them uh, based on how the participants are doing and what, what's needed. And their aim is trying to help groups to become more coherent, think together, aligned, experimental, collaborative, by the members sharing ideas, being open, listening, thinking, problem solving. That's the role of the facilitator. In the guide, we go more into facilitation there. We cover all of this in more depth, so I encourage you to go and look at that. The guide is Creative Commons. It's open source, so you're free to go and download it, use it as you see fit. We do recommend that you have a facilitator, someone experienced and who has knowledge in doing this if you're if you're planning to run a lab. So this is the first version. It's still kind of in beta mode. Uh, we're iterating through it and learning to see what works and updating it over time.